Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trend Micro's Internet Safety for Kids and Families program, and also to our Managing Family Life Online webinar series. This is a series where we come together and talk about a number of issues related to kids, technology, and what impact that has on parents, on families, and on schools. Uh, today we're going to discuss a topic that I think has many of us perhaps anxious, um, a little bit on edge, and curious, and that is the issue of going back to school and what that means to our kids. Uh, I'd like to first, before we get started, welcome our guest, Michelle Ciccone. Michelle is an educator and the, a technology integration specialist at Foxborough High School in Foxborough, Massachusetts. And I would also like to welcome Noelle Lobo. Noelle is an interpreter with the Learning Center for the Deaf in Framingham, Massachusetts. I encourage you all to submit questions using the Q&A feature at any time during this session. And uh, we will also be recording today's session. So that recording will be available on our website once we conclude. And I finally want to thank everybody for joining us today to talk about this really important topic. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to ask you all a question. And I'd like to encourage you to use the um, the polling feature um, in order to do that. Okay. Get started here. So this is the first question. What did summer technology use look like for you and your kids? There was a lot more screen time less screen time and more time outside. There was a healthy balance of online and off. Is summer over already? So please use the polling feature that's in front of you. Um, and we'd just like to know how your summer was. Great. I think it looks like um, it looks like good for you, a healthy balance a healthy balance of time online and off. Um, and that's a really good um, outcome, I think, uh, something that I'm sure that was quite challenging for all of us as we were trying to navigate a lot of uncertainties and a lot of new situations. Um, but I'd also be really, really interested to understand what the fall is going to look like for you and your kids. So how does back to school look for you? Will they be starting remote or doing homeschool? A hybrid version, which would be going remote or in person and in person, alternating. Uh, in person only, or will they start off remote at home and then proceed to go in person or a hybrid version of that? So would love to get um, your thoughts on this. And just again, use the polling feature and let us know. And, uh, and there's some interesting um, information that I wanted to share with you about how it looks across the United States at this moment. Okay, so it looks like in person, um, followed closely by a remote or a remote start, and, uh, and then in-person or hybrid. So that's very, very interesting. Where I live, we're actually doing hybrid or remote. That was the choice for families. And, um, you know, I think with regard to, or regardless of how your kids will be going back, I do believe this is going to be a challenging year ahead. And uh, we don't know a lot yet, but um, here's what we do know that as of today, according to Education Week, 
43 of the 50 states will be allowing the multiple return models. So depending on the district, you could go back remote, go back hybrid, uh, go back in person. So the state is allowing, you know, individual districts to decide. Um, but three states are saying only hybrid or remote. They're actually not mandating or allowing full-time in-person. And those states are Delaware, North Carolina, and Virginia. Again, that's as of today. Things change quite quickly. Um, but the other thing that we know is, uh, and I'm sure Michelle will hear a lot more in a bit from you on this, but going back in person is quite costly. And I don't know if some of you um, are experiencing this, but a lot of districts have decided to use what you see in the picture there, which is called a sneeze guard. It's a plexiglass on three sides of the desk. And each of those devices can cost anywhere from $89 to $166 per, um, per item. And uh, that's that can be quite a huge undertaking for a school district for, for just the plexiglass alone. The um, second largest district in South Carolina, Charleston County School District, which is about 50,000 kids, uh, I believe has just spent $2 million on, on plexiglass alone. That doesn't include PPE, doesn't include additional cleaning and sanitizing, busing, so on. Um, the other challenge is that shortages are starting to happen with devices. So school districts trying to procure devices for their students or even parents who choose remote and are trying to get their hands on an inexpensive Chromebook. There are shortages of all kinds going on right now across the United States. So that is forcing some districts like my own kids district to allow bring your own device from home. That in and of itself presents a huge number of challenges, as we know in corporations. You start to open up risks like security, risks like um, privacy to privacy and private information. So this is really going to be, like I said, a challenging year ahead. And finally, for those who choose to stay remote or those districts that don't give you an option other than remote, that is costly too. And, and we'll hear from Michelle later on about, you know, some of those challenges to academic progress for students of maybe in some groups, to social and emotional uh, well-being of children. And again, if you need to get a device, if you need to, you know, increase your internet connectivity, the financial cost to you. So again, a challenging year ahead, but what we hope through this discussion today through this series, which we hope you will continue to join us over the coming months, um, that there will be some ways to weather this together and to learn and to learn from each other best practices and, and do whatever we can to get through it and, and make it um, a safe and successful year for our kids. Um, and no matter how you decide to go back to school, um, we do want to remind you that this series began last April, and we have available to you a lot of resources on our website. Um, the one that I want to really draw your attention to is this first one, Setting Up Your Home. In that particular session and uh, with those resources, you'll find a really nice checklist on how to set up your home while everybody's trying to do school and you're trying to work from home and how do you make it so that nobody's, you know, um, running into each other, um, optimizing your connectivity, not interrupting each other. So this is just a screenshot of that uh, resource that you'll be able to find on our, our website. I encourage you to take a look at that and certainly share it with others if that helps. So I think with that background, I want to I want to now transition to a conversation with Michelle um, as an educator, because everything that we've talked about up to now is really from a parent's point of view. And I think it would be very, very helpful to our audience to hear what the teacher's point of view has been and is 
as we head into this new school year. So Michelle, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, it, I think just to get started, can you just tell us a little bit about your role at, uh, at Boxborough High School? Yeah, so I'm the technology integration specialist um, which a lot of schools have, sometimes it's just at the district level, but I'm, my job is, it's not IT, it's not the hardware, it's really the um, educational, the digital tools that are being used in the classroom. So my job is to help teachers to use um, digital tools for learning. So this has been obviously um, a really good time to be in the tech integration specialist um, uh, position, um, it's really accelerated a lot of um, adoption and just like uh, figuring out how to make tools work, work for you in the classroom. I could imagine that your email inbox must have been something. <laughs> when everybody went into lockdown back in, I guess it might, was it March for you? Yes. Yep. March 16th or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so walk us through that. What, what happened? What was your experience when, when the communication went out that you would be going remote for the remainder of the school year? What was that like? Um, it was a lot of unknown at first, and we sort of um, put things on pause while we figured out like what, what we could really do as a district. But then it became very personalized support that I was providing. Um, I, um, I spent a lot of like one-on-one -on -one time with colleagues, sharing my screen, them sharing their screen, saying, click on that button, go there. Um, and it was, it, it was a lot. I mean, I, I don't work in a small school, but um, it was um, a really, it was a really like good opportunity to get a peek inside people's brains and see how they were, um, like the questions that they were asking themselves as they were thinking about how do I translate what I know how to do in the classroom to a remote setting. Um, and I, you know, I think um, a lot of what I do, and I'm borrowing from um, someone in my professional network, Wes Fryer, when I say a lot of what I do is I'm like a tech therapist. Um, it's really like helping my colleagues understand that they, they can do it. They can figure it out. Um, maybe right now they don't know how to use a particular tool or how to translate um, cl a classroom practice to a hybrid or remote situation, but, um, but, but they can. And a lot of it is just, um, honestly, it's confidence. So I feel like a lot of my job was to, to like boost, boost confidence. Like, yeah, you can figure it out. It's a, like just ask yourself these questions when you're when you're approaching this interface or when you're thinking about how to translate practice. Um, so yeah, a lot of individualized support, and I would say that that was also echoed um, in terms of what my teacher colleagues were providing their students. A lot of individualized, like everyone needed something different um, in this situation, and that was very tiring. But I think that's what everybody everybody needed. Okay, great. It it sounded exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm and remembering so, with rosy glasses. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm curious to know what, how the kids adjusted from, from an educator's perspective, you know, early in the process and then as the year went on, how did the kids adjust? Um, it really varied, I think. I, in general, I would say, um, and I would say this like from my personal experience as well, this situation, everyone became a heightened version of themselves. So students who were um, motivated and engaged in school, like that's, they're, they were able to maintain that level of engagement. Um, but if school was, is not easy for you, it, it was, not easy remote, of course. Um, so some, you know, there was some uh, lack of engagement at the beginning as everyone was trying to figure this out. 
Um, and then maybe late April when things, um, when protocols and processes were um, being figured out, then you saw students checking back in and, and, and saying, okay, now I'm ready to, I'm ready to, to plug into whatever we're doing. Um, and, you know, and sometimes it was, in some cases it was the opposite. Like there were students who were engaged at the beginning and then it became exhausting. Like it was exhausting for everyone. And, um, and there were some students that was just like, this is too hard for me to manage everything that's going on. And then you saw some drop off in engagement toward the, toward the end. So it was very, um, there were a lot of needs that were revealed through this. Um, but in general, I would say um, it's not, it's not like anything, um, it, it, it was a heightened version of what was already happening. And even if in the classroom you didn't notice there were some gaps in executive functioning or like some, you know, gaps in engagement, um, it, there was no way to hide it in a remote scenario. So I think that actually going into this school year, we have a lot of data about, um, about students. Like we understand um, who we need to check in with and make sure that we set up for success moving forward and who, you know, maybe didn't have the most productive last five months um, school-wise. And so we know who, um, who we really need to, need to, to work closely with. Okay. Well, that seems like a little bit of a silver lining. I heard, I heard you alluding to something's good happened because of this um, and some things that might actually create lasting change for the better through our education system. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. I think so. Can, can you speak yeah. to some, an example of a, of something that might permanently be changed because of the remote learning mandate? <laughs> Well, I would say um, a few things come to mind. Like I, I do think that e this was this was hard, but I think that some students really flourished in really unexpected ways. Um, towards the end of the year in June, I worked with um, the World Language Department to um, to do sort of like a creative end of the year project where we asked we provided a lot of options about a type of media to produce and a bunch of prompts to reflect on the. Um, on what the what the spring was like for you, we we positioned it as like a time capsule. We're putting together a digital time capsule so we can remember what this was like. Um, and there were some student um, student creative projects that students that like I I I I knew from class that really were talking about how they started a YouTube channel and got really into creating these videos and had started. Um, you know, getting an audience and interacting in a way that I never saw him interact um, in school. And students were writing the music and poetry and really reflecting on what they've learned from, from the spring. So I think that oh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of tragedy in the spring. And I think we're going to, I think we're going, like, for decades, we're going to only come to really understand what, what this experience, what the impact of this experience is on a generation. But that being said, I think that actually there's skill and, um, and just like character building, honestly, that was um, also happening. Um, so I, you know, I think kids really learn resiliency and really um, uh, are, I also think really wanting to, to talk and reflect on that. So I really hope that going into the fall that schools um, provide space for really reflecting on what, on what everyone experienced, what everybody learns as a result. That's a really great point. I, I read, um, I think it was, a, it was a college professor who on day one, they were beginning remote. And she asked one question thinking it would be a 10 minute icebreaker of a 90 minute lecture or 90 minute class. How was the, how was your summer? How are you feeling? Just a check-in 
and it took the entire class mm -hmm. because everybody needed a place to answer that question and wanted to be heard, those students. So I think as parents, you know, after their first day of school, this is not a bad thing to ask and just get yourself to just shut your mouth and listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just listen. The entire dinner, whatever you can do, I don't know, maybe that would be a useful thing that we could do at home mm -hmm. when they come home from their first days of school. Um, well, that's that's great to learn. And, you know, I did hear also about and I'm not sure if this was apparent to you in your experience, but those children who are introverts really did fine because the pressures of being, you know, physically around others when maybe that caused them anxiety to do that um, were completely fine with this model. I, is that something you either witnessed or heard about at your school? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I, I just, I think that, um, I, I think, I think there's students who really appreciate it, just having an opportunity to, to sort of be self-directive about how, like, how they did their work and what, um, uh, the pace they did their work or how they chose to engage, um, and I hope that we can maintain some of that choice going into this school year because I, I do know um, it, it seems to me that a lot of districts are becoming a lot more prescriptive. Like there's bell schedules in the, um, when students are at home and they are on the remote days if it's a hybrid schedule. And I, I do think it's important to have, to have a, a, um, a schedule like that. But I also, I, I think that I think that students kind of, to a certain extent, they know what works for them. And I think if we can maintain um, some, an opportunity to, to play with that and to, and to understand, like, um, do, you, do you work better in the evening than in the morning? Or do you want to check in with your teacher after you start um after you tackle a few practice questions or whatnot. Like, I, I think that um, this one size fits all model, I mean, it never, never really worked in K-12 education. And I think we're discovering that um, it really doesn't work. And so, um, yeah, to whatever extent we can, we can just honor and make room for all of the different ways that um, humans, <laughs> humans interact with each other and, and work and operate and think. Um, I think that's going to make the next year um, better for everybody. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. Um, now I, I do want to ask this because I, I feel like uh, I personally knew of some of these situations, but um, there are also challenges uh, with remote models. Um, and, and even if kids go back, in person, but then doing things remotely at home afterwards, um, with maybe some misuse of <laughs> Zoom or Google Classroom. Um, and, you know, again, I don't want to paint a tr totally negative picture, but that challenge does happen, I know. So can you speak to maybe an example or two that may have happened when everything locked down and you went remote this past year, or even from the past? Um, I mean, I, I do, there's some silliness. Yes. Like, um, uh, I mean, I didn't experience this, but I know that, um, in some, some colleagues or people that I know in other districts, um, when classes would be video conferencing, the chat might get silly. And so, um, the response was to shut down the chat. Chat is no longer open. Um, but I, you know, I wonder, I think that was a, that's kind of a sign from students that they um, are looking for ways to socialize and to like in a lower stakes way, like interact with their peers. And so I'm, I don't, I don't think that the answer should be let's shut down avenues for and I don't know if it's just silliness, but avenues for 
safe transgression, I guess. I don't know if that's the right phrase, but I, I think that um, we've heard, we heard from students that they really, they really want opportunities to socialize. Like they, they're really begging schools to please make room for us, for me to interact with my peers in a non-academic way. And uh, first of all, I think that's proof that, you know, we can sort of assume that young people don't look up from their screens. They just, they just want to, they don't interact with people in real life. They just want to interact through screens. But I think this is proof that actually that's not exactly accurate because I think young people really are begging for ways to, to, to interact. So, yeah, I, I guess I look at, um, I mean, there was also, there's also horrific examples of Zoom bombing and like not, I mean, like really potentially traumatic situations. But I, I choose to look at those like, safe transgressive acts as um something to really like lean into and work with and um and you know i hope that i hope that there's space we're not just tied to the curriculum this year and like advancing standards and every and all of that i think really what kids are wanting and what they need is just um socialization you think that if if the hours there spending for school, whether it's online or in person or hybrid. Uh, we're focused on that and then it, as a family, we allow a little bit more um, that non-academic socializing time. Do you think that would um, lessen the pressure on the schools to have to make that space? Or do you think it's necessary to weave it into uh, the academic experience? That's a good question. I I think it's necessary. Um, I think it's necessary to, I mean, I, that's why it's an age-old tradition for the teacher to sometimes choose the groups that students work with, because I think it's, um, there's benefit to, um, as you're growing up, to be interacting with people that maybe you wouldn't have chosen to interact with, or you wouldn't have opted in, it's not in your circle of friends. So I, I think, however, um, schools can um, facilitate some of that, I think is, um, is, yeah, I think that's beneficial. Well, it's good to know. I mean, we, that's, I think for, for parents listening, that's a, uh, something to keep in mind if, and maybe even to ask the teachers if they are accounting for that at all mm -hmm. during the school day, because it may explain the child's behavior then when they're done with school why they want to get on, you know, TikTok or um, Call of Duty, Battle Royale <laughs> with friends. Yeah. It's really a longing for the connection because they didn't get to do it all day. Exactly. That's, that's a good point. I think that's a really good point. Um, so uh, what, how have you and your school been preparing this summer for, for the upcoming year? And when does that start actually next week? Yeah, students come back on okay. Monday. Staff has been in um, for two and a half weeks now. Um, to be honest, um, if I can be candid, I was a little, it's a little frustrating um, that um, state leadership didn't, didn't let us really know what was happening until late into the summer. I think there was some, some time wasted because we were um, – because everybody was juggling like three different scenarios. Oh, that's what happened in Massachusetts. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened in other states, but I think there was like kind of some denial about um, what the fall was going to look like. Um, I mean, I will say personally, something that was really important for me to do this summer was to be a learner as much as possible. So I, um, I participated in two week-long remote um, courses or professional developments. Um, and um, that was important to me because I wanted to remember, I wanted to be reminded of what it's like to be a student in a remote scenario and to, um, and to experience different ways of um, uh, a different um, instructional strategies that um, these remote teachers were using. Um, so I'm really happy that I did that because I was reminded of how exhausting it is. And I'm a motivated adult um, and it was still exhausting for me. 
Um, and I know that a lot of my colleagues did the same thing. If not, if not exactly that, there was a lot of um, wanting to experience um, the tools we knew we were going to use as a participant, as a learner. Um, and I, I do think that that um, is, yeah, I think that's going to serve us really well going into this school year. Um, and I, I hope that um, I hope that we remember that it is. I mean, especially. I keep thinking about this working in a high school where a high school schedule, it's seven or eight classes that you are juggling. I mean, that is unheard of. Even in um, uh, online uh, online classes, an online program in higher ed, I mean, you're never taking that many classes at once. Um, and so that's something that I, I'm really, I'm really keeping my eye on. Like, how, what is it like to juggle eight online um, classrooms. And I, I don't know, I think that's something that at the end of the year, we're going to really have to debrief with each other on. Were they, so um, just to dig, digging into this a little bit, were people planning towards existing criteria and curriculum and just figuring out what tools they needed in order to do that? Or was there a reimagining of the curriculum entirely? Um, I think it was a mix. I mean, there certainly was, there's certainly a, an, an acknowledgement that we, everyone needs to pare down. Like there's just not, um, there's not enough time. There's not enough room for everything that you would normally be able to tackle in 180 days. And not to mention that Massachusetts now it's 170 days. So we've lost 10 instructional days. Totally. Um, you know, this is something I think about a lot. The, the extent to which this is a moment to reimagine education. I think that um, this year is going to be really hard. And I, I guess I'm looking at the next school year when hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, things can sort of go back to normal. We'll, um, we don't have to be in these hybrid situations. Um, I'm I'm really looking at that as the moment to um, to really I don't know just look at each other and and say like okay we have to throw out all these things that we all these boundaries we thought there were or all these ways in which we thought this is the way things have to be and we and we learned that it actually doesn't have to be like that so what do we do moving forward um, so yeah, there's pockets. I, I think this this is just going to be a really hard year, and I think some people are able to. There's some educators who are able to right now um, really reimagine and think outside of um, all possibility or what felt like a possibility. And I think that there's there is some that it's just you know what I just need to I need to translate what I did in the classroom online and make it make it work and make it engaging and. I think that's where we're at. That's great. Um, well, I think um, there is some suspicion, and I know we have a lot of attendees from different countries here today, but there's some suspicion that, you know, we may begin a school year, but then have to go right back to where we were <laughs> in mm -hmm. the spring. So we really should all prepare anyway for some version of remote learning to continue. Um, but what would you, one of the things that was really important part of that was the camera. And it's something we talk about when we talk to kids about cell phones. A lot of what we talk about is really focused on that camera and what we're doing with it and how we use it. Um, but I think the same is true for remote learning and the camera. The camera being a point of contention, uh, sometimes between student and teacher, sometimes between student and parent, um, sometimes maybe between parent and teacher. <laughs> um, so what is your philosophy on, you know, cameras on and, you know, looks, look straight here. Um, what can you, can you give us your perspective on that? And what is the school's uh, policy on it? for remote learning? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so 
um, my school and I think a lot of schools. Um, so I'll say in the spring, I think the experience was it, it sort of became the um, the like cu cultural norm of online classrooms among students to turn the camera off. And I, I'd heard from colleagues that even at the beginning, even maybe half of students had their cameras on, but then as it became clear, oh, we don't, we don't have to keep our cameras on, it then became the norm to have cameras off. And I know as someone who has spent a lot of time on Zoom, um, that it is really uncomfortable to be talking to a screen of blank screens. Um, so there's no denying that. And I also, and I think that, you know, I think a lot of schools want to do the video classes to maintain community, to maintain, I mean, in addition to delivering academic content, but also to, as a way to maintain the classroom community and the relationship between teacher and student and among students. And I'm left pondering, well, what kind of community is, is created when all the cameras are off? So I, I do think that, um, th that norm of cameras being off is uh, detrimental to, to that. Um, that being said, I, I do not think that it is a good idea to, as a school, as whoever, to ma mandate turning cameras on. I think that I've heard from colleagues that um, if, as a teacher, getting together with a smaller number of students, like a small group, you're much more likely to have students wanting to turn cameras on. And I think that that's because it's, it's a smaller conversation. There's people depending on you and your participation. When you have 25 people in a Zoom, of course, you, are, you feel less significant to, um, to, the, to the community that's being um, created. So my, my feeling is let's, let's get smaller groups together because I think that that's, gonna, that's going to um, help students interact anyway. I think, you know, I also think, um, and this is where it's like not really the party line and this is my personal opinion, but I think in this day and age when we want young people to care about their privacy, to, um, to not put themselves out there online as much as we perceive that they are, this is an example of young people really creating a boundary for themselves and deciding, I actually don't want to put myself on screen in this way. And I think that we kind of have to honor that. I think we have to, we have to see that as some, sort of some feedback. And I think that, I think that it's, um, I think as a teacher saying, you know, I, it really, it helps me to, or, it's important to me to be able to see you and to, to share your to share your needs as an instructor. But I I actually I think that um, it's kind of hypocritical to 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 really demand and want young people to demonstrate um, you know boundaries. But then when they they maintain a boundary, it becomes a problem. So I don't know. I think that. It, um, it's just going to become, it's going to become a battle if we're demanding cameras on. I hope that we can avoid it. I know that a lot of districts aren't, and I don't know. I think that, um, I think that respecting, it's a sign of respect to our students to, to negotiate that, that norm. Okay. That's a, that's a good point. I think the hypocrisy is something we have to be conscientious of when, we're telling them not to post everything and don't be so, don't share everything. And then we're telling them, demanding the cameras be on exactly. when they're trying to create privacy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's an, also an issue of equity as well. Mm -hmm. Not every child has the luxury of having their own bedroom and privacy. And so somehow if some of those kids may be trying to show respect for the class by not having all the distraction that is just, part of where they live and who they are happening behind them. Exactly. So I think, you know, checking in on that. And I would say to parents out there that that might be something you want to explicitly communicate with your teachers about. Are you requiring the camera be on? And may I ask why? And I, it, it's just a good line of communication to open. Um, 
again, to relieve stress and misunderstanding among all three parties, student, teacher, and parents. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think before we open it to questions, uh, Michelle, what would you advise parents in this coming year? You know, one, two, or three things you would want them to know or help do to support their students so that they can be successful this coming year, specifically around the use of technology, whether or not they're remote, hybrid, or in-person. What what are three things that you'd like parents to do or consider? Well, I think if, if we didn't know already, I think it's very clear that young people, though they may be good at using an app or using technology for entertainment, It's not an inherent skill to be able to use technology um, for productive purposes and things like digital organization. That is not something that you develop because you're, you know, because you're 14 and you know how to use a smartphone. So I think it's, and I do this as an educator um, myself, and I think that um, as much modeling that adults can do with students about, um, like how I keep track of stuff, how I use my, my outlook calendar, um, my file system in my drive, um, how I, when I encounter a, um, a roadblock and I'm not exactly sure what to do on a website that I say, I really talk out loud the things that I'm thinking about to problem solve. And I think that that as much as we can model that for young people, um, I think the better. Um, I also think that, um, this, this, um, issue of screen time and balance, I think, um, it's important to ask young people, um, because what, what, what the, how they're feeling, what the right balance is, because I, and this is a, this is a situation where I'm not a parent. So I, I understand that my experience with young people is, is different from, from the parent perspective, but I will say as a former middle school Um, digital literacy teacher, I had students all the time vocalizing to me that they didn't want to look at a screen anymore. They were just too tired or, um, or the, they didn't want to listen. Like I would, sometimes I would play music, like if we're doing typing practice and students would say, that's too distracting. I, I can't listen to music. I think actually young people know what their limits and boundaries are. And if we can, if we can ask them and let them sort of, um, to, to, um, to get, to direct some of those routines at home, I think the better. And I, you know, with, with the caveat knowing that 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 can sort of become a battle, I'm sure at home. Um, but I, but again, like as a teacher, I, I have young people all the time vocalizing, articulating what works for them. So they, they know at a certain level um, and so as much as we can get them to be setting, setting the routines, I think the better. That's great advice. Um, actually, we had, um, I don't know if you know him, Dr. Michael Rich from the Center mm-hmm. on Media and Child Health, who, who talked about uh, rather than looking at screen time as this, um, like a forbidden fruit, um, to first talk to your kids about, the entirety of a day and everything they needed to do in that day to stay healthy, to stay up on their schoolwork, to, you know, um, the the things that were going to be really important for their, their health and their happiness and success. And then if there was time left over, once they understood and did all of those things, sure. Screen time for fun, which is by the way, different for screen time for school. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think this is where the challenge of screen time becomes an issue again, because more of those hours are going to be required of, of schoolwork now instead of Roblox (laughs) or, or, uh, yeah, or Instagram. Yeah. So, um, to that point, yeah. even when your students are in school, it's going to be more screen time this year because kids can't get up and move around and collaborate in the same way. So no matter what the scenario is, your model, it's going to be more screen time this year. So it's just more something screen. to Okay. Yeah. 
All right. I guess everybody get ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, I, I actually was thinking of getting um, more just eye drops for, for everybody in the house <laughs> because yeah. of that. <clears throat> um, well, I want to encourage our um, our attendees to submit any questions that you might have using the Q&A function right now. We have a couple of questions here, uh, Michelle, that I will um, – I'd like to review with you if that's that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a question. Would you agree that at-risk children are likely the biggest group who is the most disadvantaged with remote learning? And, you know, because they, they don't have the access to it, first of all, but that, that parents are unable to su supervise them while they're, while they're doing that learning, re remote learning. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, no matter what, students in um, disadvantaged communities are highest risk of a lot of negative outcomes. That's, that's unfortunately, the, the system we live in. Um, and it's going to be exacerbated. I think like academic um, assessments of academic learning, and it's gonna it's gonna turn up. I mean, honestly, pro this this is this is not going away after this year. This, there's going to be this is going to we're going to see this impact for for many years to come. But I will say that for those students, what where school is really hard for whatever reason, where things become a battle in classrooms because because, you know, for whatever reason, um, like sitting in a chair is really hard or, um, or, you, you know, you learn differently or, or, you know, because of, um, uh, biased policies in schools put you, um, at odds with, um, you know, the, you know, I'm thinking of like no hat policies, things that are so silly, but, become a battle. Um, I think actually the, it, there's a, there's a degree to which that being able to be at home is actually lower stress. Um, and I don't know how that plays out. I'm not a researcher in that area, but I, I think that it's, I think it's a, it's a very nuanced, um, situation. It's not, it's not all bad. It's not all good for anyone. It's not all bad for anyone. Um, I, we have another question here. Uh, any advice for uh, the households where they have multiple children in one home trying to share, you know, a single or, you know, fewer devices than there are children in the home uh, in order to meet their academic requirements? Do you have any advice? What, what does Foxborough do to support kids like that? Yeah, I would say be very vocal about that with the school and the districts um, and to make that very clear in any sort of survey that a school is sending out. I know that um, like my district sends out surveys asking the question, is there a device in the home? And we'll get responses. Yes, there is. But then we'll learn months into in, in it's, it's one device being shared among many. And not knowing that means that we can't accommodate for that. And, act, and you know, Foxborough, like I think a lot of schools, um, have additional devices to loan out. Um, so that's like a super easy fix to that. But um, it's, it's always better to communicate that with teachers, with the principal, with whoever, because accommodations can, can definitely be made. Okay. That's great advice. So make, make, make your needs be known so they can make alternative arrangements. You know, we actually tried to, being in, in the tech industry, both my husband and I made a lot of laptops. So we actually, at the beginning of lockdown, tried to offer and donate them to the district. Mm -hmm. And they turned us down because I think the inherent risks when you're taking someone else's device, you got to make sure it's safe and all of that. Um, it sounds like now they'd rather take the district-owned devices my kids have back and then let my kids come in with, with our home owned devices. So I think you're going to see some version of that happening, if not already across the country, uh, especially if 
those who started in person end up going remote, and those who started as hybrid remain that way for the rest of the year, and those who started remote remain that way for the rest of the year. So, because um, apparently those Chromebooks are like hotcakes right now. Oh yeah, they're really hard to get. Very very hard to get. Um, oh yeah. So, um, and I think I think one one last question I'll ask here. We've got we've got a few more, but we just have time for one more. And that is, um, how are school districts going to assess the success of remote learning versus in class learning once we get through all of this? Yeah. How is that being measured? It's a really it's a really good question. Um, I. So in the spring, um, to sort of take the pressure off and to be able to focus on um, relationships and maintaining connection, we did, um, I'll speak for my district, we did sort of, we, we, there were no like tests allowed to be given. Um, that's going to be different going into this school year. There, we're going to be able to assess um, so we can have that sort of data. Um, but I, something that I'm really encouraging of is to very regularly, um, solicit or get feedback from students about how it's going and, um, what's working, what's not, not in a way to, you know, point any fingers or whatever, but really, um, just this is, I, I guess I'm looking at this as, um, if before we looked at it, this is terms and semesters and a year, I want to look at this much um, in much smaller increments. And, you know, every couple of weeks, I think that we really should be getting feedback from students about what's working, what's not, and what can be tweaked. Um, so I think you're going to see, um, you're going to see some, you know, academic assessment data, but I think also just continuing to, to get some survey data um, to get feedback from stakeholders like parents and, and students. Yeah, and there's a trickle down effect here too. I know that um, there's this this phrase, you know, teaching to the test, and it doesn't necessarily mean you taught somebody how to learn just because they can take a test mm -hmm. very well. And large um, in large systems like UC, the UC, University of California and university system, now foregoing SATs and saying, there's more to a student than just that well, here we are in a pandemic and those tests were all canceled. They could not host those this past year. It's really um, the ripple effect we, we don't even know yet. So if that's something that universities are no longer going to care about, maybe again, this is an opportunity to reimagine yeah. how, how we're doing it and why we're doing it. And um, But I think it's going to take more consistency from from the universities yeah. trickling down um, for those students who want to pursue that that path after high school. Yeah, um, I feel the same way about APs as well. Like it's, yes. I, yes. I, I hope that colleges will sort of lay off on the expectations of AP tests because what happened with the AP test in the spring was not great and caused a lot of stress. And I hope that we can just loosen expectations a little bit on what we expect kids to be achieving in high school right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Michelle, I thank you so much for your time today. This was a, I, I think we could talk a lot longer about all of these challenges um, coming up and I'd love to invite you back. Maybe as you say, checking in in increments, but mm -hmm. I would say maybe in another six months or so, see where we are um, yeah. and how the school year is going. I'd love to hear back from you on that. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and also for participating with your questions and just, just listening and learning. Um, I'd like to also um, remind everybody that we do have, one of the things that we're going to be doing going forward is from these conversations with our guests, we're going to collaborate with our guests on creating new resources and tips um, that will be posted on our website at the conclusion. So some of the pieces of advice that Michelle shared with us today will be documented there for you to review again, to share with other families. Um, 
And finally, um, I would like to encourage you to um, join us on September 23rd. September 23rd will be our next session with um, Microsoft, actually, uh, and specifically Jill McClenahan from um, Microsoft Xbox, who will be telling us about a new feature, a new app to actually help um, manage some of that time online on the Xbox with our kids. At the conclusion of today's session, you will be sent to a survey. We'd love to hear back from you about whether how you felt about the content and, um, and the usefulness of the information you got today. So please do uh, go ahead and fill that out. It's very, very short. If you enter your email address, you may, um, you may be selected to win a copy of Trend Micro Maximum Security, which is a one-year subscription and protects up to five devices in your home. Um, so again, thank you so much to Michelle. Thank you, Noel. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been with us today. We will see you on the 23rd. Thanks. Thank you.